So great to be back at Grace. It was a wonderful service yesterday. I enjoyed preaching to you. Someone came up to me afterwards and they said, we've heard all kinds of preachers describe all kinds, describe all kinds of theology, but we've never heard anybody call anybody a dumbbell from the pulpit. <laughs> when you get gray hair, you can do lots of stuff and get by with it. We're talking about going deep. Yesterday we laid the foundation, but uh, these services are not uh, repetitive uh, it's going to be built on night after night. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about what it means to, to know God, knowing him rightly. Do you remember the pattern I said, what, how, how, how historically and biblically, how have men and women gone deep? They, it's a threefold umbrella, okay? The first one is what? You ought to have a... Don't depress me the first night. That's... <laughs> Somebody, what? You get an A plus right back there. Experiencing God, encountering God. No, you got to know him rightly. We're going to talk about that tonight. As I said yesterday, I think the number one problem in churches today is in many people's mind, they have an unhealthy, skewed, off-center view of God. Second step is you have to encounter yourself. You remember, you got to look under the hood. And when you look under the hood and take a, uh, enabled by the Holy Spirit in the context of grace, you see what we are inside. We are defiled by sin and damaged by sin. And that's going to be a crucial one. I'm not, because of the, we're, uh, we're being, we're actually, we're, being, we're abbreviating these, believe it or not. And I'll talk a little bit about sin, but mostly about the damage aspect. <clears throat> We're broken people that are damaged. Sin requires forgiveness, cleansing. Damage requires healing. That'll be Tuesday morning. Tuesday night, a little bit of a diversion. Back Wednesday morning, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, the third component, who can take a damaged, defiled self and make them everything God wants them to be. And we'll do two, section, two, two, uh, two services on the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> And after I'm done tonight, uh, we'll, we'll uh, have a Q&A, okay? And a lot of people are a little bashful about asking questions. Uh, I understand that. But let's, let's lay some ground rules on questions, okay? Please don't give up. Don't get, don't get up and try to correct me on everything I've said. Uh, do that privately up front. I'll listen to you. Just come on up. Let me have it. But if you ask a question, okay, if you've got a question, ask a question. Don't give us a paragraph give us a question a sentence is that a deal ah oh, you're a great crowd all right let's talk about what it means to know God one of my favorite passages in recent years in the Old Testament Jeremiah 9 23 through 24 and by the way he gave you a clue on how to catch you can certainly take pictures of all of them or <clears throat> you can just ask me to email them to you uh, either way you want to do it, okay? And I'll do it. God said to the prophet, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. You get around a guy with a PhD from Harvard, guess what he is going to let slip out? Yeah, I was at Harvard back in 70. <laughs> let not the mighty man boast in his might. You get some guy with working out and all these, what is it, biceps, triceps, Anyway, he's bulging. He's got these muscles. I preached to a guy who was an amateur weightlifter. He could lift 1,000 pounds. And he shows up in a tank top uh, showing everything that he had. No, no. Don't let the mighty man boast in his might. No, let the rich man boast in his riches. As a college president, I had to be around. I had to court a lot of rich people to raise money. And boy, could they tell you about stocks and bonds and lake houses and mountain homes. God said, that's not what you boast in. Your wisdom, your strength, your money. He said, you want to boast in something? Boast in this. Boast in the fact that you understand and know me. That I am the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. When you see that, that is the personal name for God. Yahweh. 
I am Yahweh who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I take delight. The New Testament, John 17, 3, I quoted it yesterday, and this is eternal life. When somebody tries to give you their own canned definition of eternal life, quote John 17, 3, and say, look, let's just go to the original source. Jesus said he defined eternal life. And he said eternal life is that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Little grandson was on the floor in his grandfather's den, drawing furiously. And his grandfather was so curious at what he was drawing, he walked up and he looked down. He said, son, what are you drawing? He said, well, Papa, I'm drawing a picture of God. His grandfather said, well, I didn't know anybody knew what he looked like. To which the little boy replied, they will when I'm done drawing him. (laughs) Do you know we all have a picture of God drawn in our head? It's the default mode of your spiritual hard drive. Everything reverts to it. That view, it, it may not be a picture, but it's a narrative of God that is there. And we all have one. And that narrative causes, it affects everything about us spiritually. We all have this picture. Some see God as a judge sitting on a throne, looking over their shoulder, scowling at a distance. Others see him as the giant Santa Claus of heaven that should be pouring out some blessings on me. Some see him as a king, a distant, remote royalty that cannot really be approached. We all have this picture of God. For all the years I was a college president, I had a D group, my discipleship group. They met in our home. And that very room, we would, we would have a snack in the dining room. We would move to the living room. And there's a fireplace back there. And we would sit in a circle around the fireplace and the, on the furniture. And one night, just as sort of a test thing, I said to my D group, I said, if God just chose to reincarnate himself, walk through the front door, come through this archway, and he turned and looked directly at you, what would the countenance on his face say? What would his face say to you if he was looking at you right now? And four girls, four guys, the first person I pointed to and asked that question, who's now a missionary in Africa, brilliant young girl, Marika, and she looked as sober as a judge. She looked back at me and she said, you know, I think his face would say, Marika, you can do better. You can, you can kick it up a notch. We're talking about a 4.0 student who was a deeply spiritual, highly active in ministry, talented young woman. But she couldn't measure up. And as we went around the room, the same form or the same expression of what she said fell out of almost everybody's mouth. Every response was this performance-oriented response. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do better. We all have this narrative, this image, this way we see God. Dallas Willard said it like this. He said, the single most important thing in our mind is our idea of God and the associated images. The mystic at Tozer put it like this. You've probably all heard it. What comes into our minds when we think about God Is the most important thing about us. He said we tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward that image we have of God. George MacDonald, the author that highly influenced C.S. Lewis, said everything, to 
depends on the kind of God one believes in. William Temple put it in a much more sober way. He said, if your concept of God is wrong, the more religion you get, the more dangerous you become to yourself and everybody else around you. And he's right. Dallas Willard put it in another way. He said, to serve God well, we must think straight. And crooked thinking, unintentional or not, always favors evil. It's crucial that we get it right. What does your picture of God look like? My first little church was a Quaker church. They more commonly known as Friends. And it was just a little handful of uh, uh, Quakers. There was only about 10 or 11 of them. I was just still a kid in Bible college and just, I was going to be their pastor for a while and I didn't know much about it, but they didn't know much about it either, so we were all in the same boat. (laughs) But I did have a guy in the congregation, a guy named Paul Myers. And Brother Myers was a, he had read his Bible through so many times. He had underlined, he had marked, till it was just falling apart. He had read every theology there was. Every Christian classic, he had read it. As a young college student training to be a minister, I wouldn't have argued the Bible with him. He would have pinned my ears to the wall. He fasted regularly. He prayed long prayers. But I'll never forget the Sunday morning that I was trying to encourage my little flock of friends and preach something on heaven and the good things to come. And as any young good preacher would do, I finished the sermon, went to the back door, put my Bible under my left arm, got my right hand out, and was going to shake hands with everybody as they went out the door. And here comes Brother Myers. And so he was coming along like puddle glum. And I reached out to him and I took his hand. I said, isn't God good, Brother Myers? And here's exactly what he said, how he said it. He said, oh, will any of us make it? Now, listen to me. Paul Myers loved God with all of his heart. There is no doubt in my mind about it. But the God he had in his head, he didn't like one little bit. Now, hang on to that. When I was 14, I went to work in the drugstore in Centerville, Alabama, Meg's Rexall Drugstore. And I started out as the janitor. I worked my way up to the soda fountain. And by the time I was 17, I was filling prescriptions. Believe it or not, that's true. (laughs) But my boss... Louise Rogan. That's not her. (laughs) But (laughs) it's her twin sister. It could have been her. And my boss had to be one of the meanest, I mean mean, women you ever met in your life. She had blazing red hair. She smoked Virginia Slim steadily. She was an alcoholic that kept a soda fountain glass in her hand, half Coke, half Jack Daniels, constantly drinking all through the day. She cursed, she swore, she could tell the nastiest jokes you've ever heard. She would, could burn your ears with her filth. So you can imagine my shock. One Saturday morning, I was working the cash register at the front of the store, pharmacy was in the back. A lady from up the street came down on the hardware store. She was a wonderful Christian lady. And she was standing up there talking to me about how good God was, how much she loved the Lord, and on and on and on. And here my boss comes up. Here she comes, puffing away, drinking it up. And she heard, she stepped into the middle of this conversation. And she said at the right place, she said, isn't it wonderful? Waved her arms. All you have to do is just believe. Oh, isn't it so wonderful? 
Listen to me very, very carefully. Louise Rogan didn't love God one bit. Not one bit. But she liked the God she had in her head a whole lot. Now, I've kind of given you two extremes. But every person in this room falls on the spectrum between those two, those two pictures of God. You're all on it. We all have this narrative of God. I'm going to open up and be a little vulnerable to you tonight. Uh, I grew up in an extremely conservative church. A lot of good country people. But our view of God was kind of the uh, little bit of the harsh, evangelistic. Uh, you heard a lot about hell and Sometimes you wondered if the preacher wanted you to go there. And just, it was, it was pretty tough. And so when I got saved at age 17, boy, I took this stuff seriously. You know, God, God, the demand, the, God's demands are high. I mean, it's a narrow way. You're, we're going to barely get into this. So I'm, I'm going to give it 110%, maybe 150%. And I did. I went through college. I was no snack bar scholar, man. I was, I was there. If I told you my freshman routine, getting up at 4.30 every morning, praying for an hour, studying the word, being, being ready for class at 7, I was dead serious about it. Early days as a pastorate. Back, back in those days, you made calls. I made 2,000 calls a year, about 500 calls a quarter. You ought to try it sometime. I was, I was all in. But the truth of the matter is, for the first 20 years of my Christian experience, I smiled very little. There wasn't a lot of joy in it. And I suddenly bumped in to a man of God who had the most joy-filled experience I've ever met in my life. And I realized there's something deficient here. What is this? And I began to dig. I began to pray about it. And I began to read. And through a period of time, God began to show something, show me something that the image I had of him sort of burned on my brain, branded in my soul, was skewed. I saw him as a perfectionist to which I could never, ever measure up. As Paul said, I far exceeded all of those my age and around me. And quite frankly, I did. But if you'd have asked me, I'd have said, I've never done anything. Not me. And my head would, would hang. First 10 years of my college presidency, I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but we did a massive turnaround, double the enrollment, double the endowment. It was huge. Keith knows he helped. But after 10 years, they gave a surprise celebration on a video, all this stuff I'd done. And I sat there crying. What are they talking about? I've never done anything. I've never done anything good. What, what do they mean? They shouldn't be saying this stuff. But over time, God began to show me some things. And I suddenly began to get a new insight into who he is. And we'll talk more about that journey. But tonight, tonight, if you ask me, how do you see God? The only way I know how to say it is the way a grandpa would say it. Our first granddaughter, when she was born, they lived down the street. She was in our house all the time. She was the apple of her eye. All you grandpas and mother, grandmas get it. But John and Beth took their first vacation after us. She was about two years old. They went away to New York. They were gone about a week. And John called us as he was coming into Cincinnati from the north side of town. He said, Dad, we're, we're coming into Cincinnati on the north side of town. And uh, you guys want to meet us on the north side? We'll get some ice cream. And you can see Avia, my granddaughter. Well, I didn't care about ice cream, but we desperately wanted to see Avia. We were already dressed for bed. 
Boy, I hung up. I, I threw that phone down. I didn't even take my pajamas off. I just jumped into my clothes, got the car. I said, honey, you meet me at the car. We rushed. We flew out there, and they were already there. John had already pulled in. He had parked. I had to park over here, and I saw him. When I was pulling in, he was getting Avi out of the back seat and putting her on the ground, and I was jumping out of the car. I didn't help Ruth out. I didn't help anybody. I was running, and I started across that parking lot, and I saw Jonathan say to Avia, there's Papa, there's Papa. And that little girl was oscillating her neck, looking for Papa. And suddenly, she caught a glimpse of me. And when she did, this big toothy grin broke out all over her face. And she said, Papa, with a big grin, just like that. When I think of God right now, if he came through that back door and started down that aisle, his arms would be outspread, his face would be beaming, and he would say, oh, son, it's so good to see you. And I could in return say, Papa, it's good to see you. That's 180 degree from what it was. Now, why is our picture of God so critical? Why is it so important that I, when I talk about this stuff, why do you need to hear it? Well, there's four reasons. Number one, how we understand God influences powerfully the kind of relationship we have with God. I can guarantee you tonight there's nobody here with an intimate, communal, loving relationship with God if they don't really like Him in their head. Number two, it's only by knowing God correctly that we can understand correctly how He wants us to live, what He actually expects from us. Number three, Whatever picture of God we shape in our thoughts, that picture of God begins to shape us. To me, God was a, was a high expectation, performance-driven, perfectionist kind of God. And quite frankly, I was becoming that to everybody around me, expecting the same thing. If we misdefine God, we misdefine everything else. The whole world gets skewed. Now, what are some of the common distortions of God? Well, let me just give you five. Number one, he's a God with impossibly demanding expectations. You can never, ever <coughs> please him. Number two, he's a God that's emotionally distant, interested only in facts and only performance. If you see God like this, if you can never please him, how can you love him? How can you want to be with him? How can you enthusiastically worship him? If he's emotionally distant and there's no warmth in it, how can you connect with him? Or he's just a busy God who doesn't have time to listen to your concerns. Or maybe you think he's a bully, a dominating tyrant. Or maybe you think he's a God that's unreliable or easily abandons you if you trip up or mess up. Some of the fallout of a distorted image of God is every distortion one has of God, there's an often a corresponding self-distortion you have of your own self. So, those who operate on the wrong information are never likely to know the reality of God's presence in the decisions that shape their life. They will miss the constant divine companionship for which their souls were made. So, how is our understanding of God developed anyway? How does all of that just come to pass? Well, there's two ways primarily that our understanding of God is developed. Number one, we live at the mercy of our ideas 
This is never often true, never truer than our ideas about God. So the first way we get our ideas about God is informationally. It's the stuff we pick up in life. Do you know the primary way, the primary means of information that is fed into every one of us? It's through our father image. You say, I didn't have a dad. It'll default to the authority image in your life. I hate to put a burden on you fathers, but I'm going to tell you something. The way you live your life in front of your children, the way you interact with those kids will be the primary way they form their view of God. I said to you a moment ago that my view of God was, was so skewed that I saw him as a perfectionist that you could never please, you could never measure up. I was giving him 150%, yet I always felt I was coming up short. Just couldn't, just couldn't quite please him. If I give you a little window into my own childhood, and, and, and I say this, I say it humbly and publicly here, but do not misunderstand what I'm about to say and, and interpret that I had bad feelings for my father because that's not true. And I'm not trying to throw him under the bus. He's a, he's, a, he's, he's a good man. He's passed. He's in heaven tonight. But a little window into my dad. My dad grew up in the Depression. He lost his father early on as a teenager. They grew up in the South in poverty as farmers. It was really, really tough. And his dad being taken away made it even tougher. He was the oldest child. He had to work hard to help make a living for the rest of the family. His grandfather was the male image now in his life. If you'd have met my grandfather, as they say in the South, he looks like he was baptized in vinegar and, and chewed saw briars, whatever that is. He could speak bluntness in seven languages. He, he was... He was pretty rough. And that was who was over my dad. My dad never learned to express love. He grew up with a little bit of just anger in his spirit about all the time. Now he has his own family. Now he's working. Now he's providing for us. I'm the, I'm the last of five children. I'm about nine or ten years old. We have a little small farm. And I was always, always, always following right in his footsteps, doing everything I could to help. But this is a typical scenario. I was riding the back of the tractor. We had to go through a gate. We got through the gate. He said, son, jump off, get that, put the gate up. It's a type of gate that it's made out of wire. It's flexible. And you put the post in a loop at the bottom. And then you pull it like this and put the loop at the top. You Idahoans know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I was too little. It, it took some strength to do that. So I couldn't get it in the top. I could get it in the bottom, but not the top. So I took it out of the bottom, got the top. At least the post stood. At least it stood. Well, of course, that wasn't going to work. My dad very angrily got off the tractor, came back, pushed me aside, grabbed the post, put it in right, fixed it turned to me, and he said, let me tell you something, boy. There are two ways to do anything, the right way and the wrong way, and you always do it the wrong way. I heard that a lot. Please, <clears throat> don't make any judgments. Just don't. Wounded people wound people. Hurting people hurt people. It took me some years to figure that out, but I got it. And so I grew up with an unbelievable, demanding, perfectionist God that I couldn't please. And guess what it did? It didn't, slow, oh, it, it didn't slow me down from trying, working, but it sucked the joy right out of my relationship to God. We learn it primarily from our fathers. Next in line are teachers. Our Sunday school teachers, you have a lot to be accountable for. Our school, our Christian schools, any teacher, our preaching. I hope you've, you're blessed with a wonderful Bible preacher. But I've heard some crazy stuff, ladies and gentlemen. 
And I know some people who won't darken the door of a church today because they heard crazy stuff about God in the pulpit. These are the secondary sources. And then we become responsible gatherers of our own information. We listen, we take class, we sit, we podcast, we study the Bible for ourselves, we watch religious programs on television or otherwise. So we start learning. It's, it's informational, that, 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 that beginning. That's how we learn about God. But we also have sources of bad information about God. Number one, Satan's going to be right there to pump everything evil he can in your mind. God is, and, and, and all these kind of crazy questions about God. Our culture I'm just, I'm here to tell you, all you got to do is watch a minuscule amount of TV and you find out what this culture thinks of God. He's the butt of every joke. He's this unfair, dumb, something or the other. And then dysfunctional home environments. They learn a lot of skewed stuff about God. Painful experiences of the past. People who've been in victims of incest and rape and other unfortunate things. How can, if God's a good God, how in the world could this happen to me? And they struggle with that and they get really bad advice. And children lose their parents at a crucial age. And some dumbbell walks up and said, well, God needed another angel in heaven. And so he took him. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have used dumbbell twice. <laughs> but, it, but that's what they are. And they get a skewed view. Oh, God took my daddy. God took my mama. And then exposure to mistruth. And then our own misguided thinking from a fallen mind. So why do we need to see and understand all of this? Because what we can't define, we can't defeat. What we, you can't change what you don't confront, what you don't see, what you don't comprehend and understand we got to get the right information in to replace the bad. But secondly, we learn about God primarily, in many ways, relationally. He's a relational being, and the Trinity has existed in, from eternity past. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, an intimate, wonderful relationship. And so we are created in His image. We are relational beings, and we learn through this thing called relationships. Back to this verse of scripture. And this is eternal life. That they may know you. If you were here yesterday, this is a bit of repetition. But the concept of know in both Old and New Testaments is not head knowledge. It is a, an intimate communal knowledge. A, a relational knowledge. An intimacy with someone. Dennis Kenlaw said it like this. He said in the Old Testament... Knowledge is living in a close relationship with someone or somebody in such a way that would evoke the idea of communion. Really, the Bible doesn't know a, an idea of knowing God that's strictly mechanical or intellectual. It always carries the idea of communion, of intimacy and relationship. It's interesting. Israel's teachers, the Pharisees, they could lecture for the hour about the Messiah, but when he came, they missed him because they didn't know him. They only knew about him. Ask Nicodemus. We can mistake knowledge for intimacy. And that's a very, very subtle mistake. You can be a diligent parishioner Sit with your Bible open, your pen out, taking notes, and you're, I'm getting more information. And that can be a substitute for an intimate relationship with Jesus. Now, quite frankly, you need both. One should feed the other. When you develop relationships, how do you do that? Well, you develop them by communion and by communication. That's how we begin to learn about God. As we walk with him, we learn about him through his word, through, through walking in the spirit. For all of you Chronicle of Narnia fans, I had to put this in for you. You remember in the Chronicles of Narnia when confronted by the idea of Aslan, the lion, 
who was a picture of God in that series, Lucy said this, remember? She said, is he safe? And Mr. Beaver responds, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. Is he safe? Well, of course he isn't. He's a consuming fire, but he's holy fire. He's loving fire. He's good. And that's who he is, and we find that out as we work with him. What are some things we seem to know about God? Well, we always seem to get his divine attributes down. We know he's a creator God. We know he's holy. We get all of the metaphors, king, judge, father, groom. We, we seem to just, I don't know, we seem to know it. We seem to pick it up. But what is the knowledge that eludes us about God that's really, really important? Well, one of them is, what's God up to? Does God just want a bunch of franchise offices scattered all over the world so he can say the, the kingdom of heaven's being extended? Oh, no, 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 no. What is he up to? Well, here's what he's up to. Take a picture of this. The aim of God in history is to have an all-inclusive community of loving persons with God himself at the very center of this community as its prime sustainer and most glorious inhabitant. That's what God wanted in the Garden of Eden. And we failed. That's what God tried to establish with a family. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. That's what God tried to do with a, a nation called Israel. That's what God has tried to do with the church. But guess what? That's what he's going to get in the end. It's a place called heaven. Where there's going to be an all-inclusive community of loving persons. And he's going to be at the very, very center as the most glorious inhabitant and the prime sustainer of everything. That's what he's up to. He's not interested in being a rule-oriented, shame-based, perfectionist God. He's interested, Edgar, in getting you and I to heaven and getting some heaven in our hearts on our way to heaven. That's what he's interested in. So... Secondly, God reveals himself in personal encounters. The prime, the key word in the first section of Genesis is the word walk. Do you know that God revealed himself first of all as a friend? He didn't reveal himself as a father to the book of Exodus. He's, he wants to walk with us. He walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. He walked with Enoch. He, he walked with, with Noah. He he wants to walk with us, have fellowship, communion. The most treasured characteristics of God listed in the Old Testament. Actually, the, we see this for the first time when the children of Israel are coming in the book of Exodus, coming out of Egypt, and they get to the foot of the mountain, and Moses is up in the mountain getting the Ten Commandments, and they don't know where he is, and they build a golden calf. Moses come down, comes down, and he sees them, and he's so angry, he breaks the tablets. He gets angry. He moves the tent of the covenant outside the camp. And right on the heel of the very first breach of the covenant that God had given, God revealed himself. Moses said, show me your glory. And God said, no, can't see my glory and live. I'm going to give you something better. I'm going to declare my name. And in the Old Testament, that was character. This is who I am. And God declared to Moses who he was. Go read Exodus 34 and you'll see it. But he, he said at the heart of all of that, he used the Hebrew word hased. It takes 14 English words just to translate it fully, and you still don't really get it. So let me give you some. It means loyal love, steadfast love, plenteous in mercy, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. That's the first way God revealed himself to a rebellious, idolatrous Israel. This is who I am. And Jeremiah, at the very heart of that story, he says, go down to the potter's house. I want to show you something, Jeremiah. And he show, you know the story about the potter, the, the, the clay that's messed up, marred. And after Jeremiah watched it all, God said, Jeremiah, can I do with this clay? Can I do with my people, Israel, just like the potter does with this clay? Make them all over again. He's the God of new beginnings. 
He delights in new beginnings. How many here have failed once or twice or maybe again or again? And the devil comes along and says, you've blown it this time. There's no use. Let me tell you something. He's the God of new beginnings. He delights in new beginnings. He's the God who will take you back. I wouldn't have had the courage to put the book of Hosea in the Bible. But God puts it there. A story about a, 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 a wife who becomes a prostitute. They have a child together. The second child, Jeremiah's not sure if it's his. The third child, he knows is not his. And she goes out into, to, as the old King James would say, she went out into whoredom. It's a, it's, it's a very graphic word that you get the message. And finally, she gets so low in prostitution, she's down to the bottom. She's a slave. And God said to, Jer to Hosea, he said, go buy her back. And she was on the auction block, and he bid. When a prostitute ended up, ended up on the slave block, they were stripped naked. Their diseased body was exposed to the whole world. Here's what you get. A completely worn, used, sick woman. And Hosea went and bought her back. And he said, now you come home and you're going to be for me and I'll be for you and nobody else. And when that happened, God said, and he used the pet name for Israel. Ephraim was the pet name for Israel. And Hosea heard God say, Ephraim, Ephraim, how can I let thee go? Even though I've given you a bill of divorcement, I'll take you back. He's the God that will take you back. He's the God of the second chance. Jonah's not about a big fish. It's about the God of the second chance. He's a God that will restore the years that the swarming locust has eaten. I've heard so many people say, man, I've wasted my life for God. I blew it. I had a chance to really do something for God, and I, I got off tracks and really blew it, and now I'm back, and I guess it's just going to be second best for me the rest of my days. I'll just be, I'll have to put up with second best. Let me tell you something. In the kingdom of God, there is no second best. He's the God that knows how to restore those wasted years. He's the God who knows how to take you right where you are and make you into everything he can make you into. That's who he is. Believe this or not, he's the God that will sing over you. Dorn, can you believe it? Can you believe that? Edgar, can, 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 Jay, do you get it? Could you actually, can you see the picture of a mother looking at the babe in a cradle and she, her heart just sings. That's God. He's singing over you. <laughs> Doesn't that blow your mind? Yeah. Oh, how many here have a little dog at home? How many love their dog more than anybody else in this building loves their dog? <laughs> Stand up if you love your dog more than anybody else in the whole building. Who loves their, no competition. Who loves their dog? Oh, they bring her to church. They got a religious dog. No, 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 no. Who loves their dog more than anybody else? Okay, you, tell me. Tell me. You love your dog. Does that dog love you? What's her name? His name. Her, her name. Peanut butter. What an interesting name. She, she got up when her name was called. I imagine, of course, peanut butter goes everywhere with you, doesn't she? Yeah, so that's not a good one. Let, let's, go, let's, let's, go, let's go to over here. Your turn. What's your dog's name? You don't know? Dottie. I take it that's, she's what? Oh, double, double. Okay, let's talk about Dottie. You love Dottie? Oh, you can tell by looking at her face. Buddy, you're in trouble. She loves Dottie a lot. But you'll go home, to, Dottie's in the house waiting on you to get home. She knows the sound of your car in the driveway, doesn't she? When she hears the sound of your car in the driveway, what will she do? No. First thing she does. What's the first thing she'll do? She won't come to greet you. What will the first thing she'll do? 
No, not set up. Why? I'm, gonna, I'm teaching you about dogs, lady. <laughs> so, you got, this guy right here knows. Those ears go straight up. Yeah, now you get it. Now you get it. First thing that happens, those ears prick straight up. This is a Jack Russell. We had a Jack Russell for many, many years. We named him a very creative name. We called him Jack. And, and Jack, oh man, we love Jack, but he wasn't in the house and, and we kept him in the yard. He loved to chase snakes and anything he could chase. And uh, we had a nice storm in Cincinnati. And Jack was now old. He had, he had a cancer and he was actually dying. And, and uh, we just couldn't bring ourselves to put him down just yet. And we had a special place in the basement with a heat lamp and little doggy door. And he could come and go and stay warm and comfortable. But I got worried about him in the ice storm. And I went outside to make sure he, could, he, could have, he had access to the outside. And he did. What I forgot was... If Jack ever heard our back door even scrape, here he come. No matter where he was, anywhere in the yard, those ears went straight up. And those front legs began to quiver, and, and he would come if, it, if he heard the door open. Of course, I'd open the door, walked out on the deck, and I did, he, everything looked good. So I went back inside, or started back inside. And as I started back inside, I saw Jack coming out through the door. He was so sick and so ill he could barely move. One foot could just, and I kept trying to say, Jack, go back, go back. Just checking on you. He was coming. Nothing was going to stop him. We have seven steps covered in ice. I said, Jack, no. He came all the way up. I said, the only way to stop him is to go in the house. So I'll go in the house, shut the door, peek through the blinds. But he's sick and he just kept coming. He got to the top step. I wasn't there. And he didn't know what to do. And he was, he was so weak. When he tried to turn, he just tumbled. And I rushed out the door. I picked him up, got him back in. And why did I tell you that moving story about a little dog? That kind of dedication and commitment. Because that's the language God used to describe himself toward us. In Malachi 3.16, there's an interesting passage. It talks about when the, when the people who fear my name, okay, that's us here. He said, when they get together and they talk, God said to the prophet, he said, I hearken and I heard. Those are two unique Hebrew phrases. You know what the word hearkened means? It means I prick up my ears. The word heard, you ever seen anybody do this? That's what that means. God said to you and I, in the language of the little animal kingdom, he said, Jay, when you hit your knees in prayer, or if you don't even get your knees in prayer, if you speak that word or don't even just think that thought, God said, my ears go straight up. And my head comes down. How many here tonight have served a God you didn't think heard you very much? I'm not where I ought to be. My God's not listening. Or the devil said, doesn't do a bit of good to pray. You're just wasting your breath. Your words are bouncing off the ceiling. On the authority of this book, I want to tell you something. God said, when that first word was uttered or that first thought went up to him, he said, my ears went straight up and my head came right down. I didn't miss a single word. I heard it all. That's the kind of God that he is. But better than all of that, he has revealed himself in Jesus. He clothed himself in the fading garment of our humanity. He was born in a stable on straw under a star. And he walked among us. And Jesus said, I am gentle and lowly in heart. It's the only place in the entire Bible that describes the heart of Jesus. Right there. And he says, I'm gentle and I'm lowly 
and heart. The pictures you see of him in the Old Testament, he said, I'm a seeking shepherd. I'm a searching woman. I'm a father of a wayward son. We don't, we don't even really get that story. It's the, that's the parable, not of the prodigal son. It's the parable of the father's heart. Look at that old man. That wayward son, he spotted him at a distance. And what does that story tell us? What, is it, what did his father do? He ran to meet him. And when he got there, what did he do? You wastrel, you spent my money, you scoundrel. No, 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 what, did he, what does it say? Come on, talk to me. Oh, somebody got it. He, he kissed him. But in the Greek, it's in the present tense. It says he smothered him with kisses. He kissed his face off, Jay. He kissed him, and he kissed him. And then he, and then he escorted him back home. They said, get these raggedy clothes off. Put on a decent cloth. Put some shoes on his feet. Get the family ring back on his finger. And let's have a party. Can you imagine the celebration that God celebrates when you and I return to him? <laughs> the greatest picture of God is right here. When the unrighteous could do nothing for themselves. Nothing. We couldn't do a thing in the world to save ourselves. You can't. He said, my own right hand wrought deliverance. He came down incarnate in Christ who died. The righteous for the unrighteous. The greatest love known to man. That is the God of the Bible. That's the God you and I serve tonight. And I want to tell you something. Not only do I love him with all of my heart, I really like him. I really like him. And that has changed my demeanor. And I'm no longer this sober, long-faced Christian doing his duty. But I'm a happy Christian, Amen. skipping along, doing his duty, enjoying the journey, loving him. What about you? What's your picture of God? All right. Questions? Got anybody with a question? Yes, ma'am. Elizabeth? <laughs> Do I look like it? No, 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 no. No, no, not, I'm as healthy as a horse. You can, you can examine my teeth and see. Healthy as a horse. No, no challenges. Oh, yeah, Mark Smith. He's a close friend of mine. Mark's, he's can kidney cancer. Mark just, uh, he's had can he had a terrible car wreck, almost killed him. Then after that, he had cancer. They took out one kidney, then most of the other one, and then his mother just passed away. Uh, Only Fail had a brain bleed, stroke, which caused him to, he's incapacitated, he had to retire at 57, and his mother just passed away. Her funeral was today. So that's, that's, that's who you're thinking about. Okay. Okay. Got a question. Okay. I just want to know, you know, because since God is in control of everything, is, um, isn't he the giver and taker of life? It all depends on what you mean by that. It depends on where you're coming from. If you, want to, if you say that as, it's, as it is, he gives life. Our days are numbered, the Bible says. And uh, so in that sense of the word, yes. He gives life, and, uh, but he doesn't take life in the sense of being a murderer. He receives our soul back to himself, okay? You can shorten your days, or you can lengthen your days by the way you live. But uh, he's not snatching it from us. He, he, he gave it, and he receives it. 
uh, at the end. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Not sure if I answered your question or not. I'm not sure where you're going with that. You want to take another run at it? Because um, when someone dies yeah. and you maybe give them the wrong information about, well, you know, the Lord, you know, wanted to take you away. Yeah. And you're, you know, you're like, um, I, I just don't know where, you know, that okay. separates. Okay, uh, now it. I see, uh, now, you're not, you're not talking in a broad theological sense. You're talking in a very practical, real world sense. No, God, of course, gives life, but he doesn't take it. He's not taking lives. He doesn't say, you're, you're, okay, your number's up, bang, you're out of here. No, it, uh, best I can tell, Christians and non-Christians die at the same rate of accidents and cancer and all the rest of it. And so, uh, no, God, God doesn't take life in the sense, Jay's number's up, let's go. Uh, Jay can lengthen his days and he can shorten his days uh, by any given number of ways. But, uh, you know, the Bible said your days are going to be three score and ten. Uh, God said, I'm shortening the lifespan because of the wickedness and evil of mankind. And he did. He shortened the lifespan. But we really brought it on ourselves. And uh, it's his mercy that we get as long as we do get. But we typically die of natural causes. And if a person dying of a natural cause or an accident or whatever, you wouldn't say God has taken them away. Uh, he has certainly received them unto himself if, he's a Christ, if they're a Christian. So my remark about don't tell a child or somebody like that, God took your daddy because he needed an angel. Number one, he didn't need any more angels. He got lots of them. And uh, we're not, our, our destiny isn't angels in it. We don't all go to heaven and become little angels floating around on clouds. We remain who we are throughout all eternity except in a glorified body. So that's why, that's why I would say that. Any other questions? That's right. Yes, ma'am. There are people who have always believed that God is love, yeah. and then they face sometimes years of unrelenting stress, mm -hmm. challenge, physical problems, financial problems, one on top of another and another. What's the best way to try to help them when they're going through a crisis of faith and, and growing depressed? Stand by them. Love them. Don't be over-talkative like you can explain away all their problems. Because, number one, you can't. Uh, we don't fully understand why the righteous suffer. Job's biggest pain, Job's worst pain, was he never understood why all that stuff happened to him. And God never told him. And we don't really know why good people suffer. Uh, it's easy to understand why bad people suffer. We get that, I guess. But God doesn't play favorites. God doesn't, I don't think God, uh, and unfortunately, and I'm not trying to be offensive here, the prosperity gospel has done a lot to create confusion and harm here. You know, you live for God, you do this, you'll, you'll drive a Mercedes, you'll live in a big home, you'll have health, wealth, and all the rest of it. That is absolute, utter nonsense. And in the, in the truest picture, it's heresy. And we need to be really, really careful about that. And that breeds this, this, this Western, mostly Western thinking, that uh, you know, prosperity equals righteousness, that kind of stuff. And so, well, if, 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 I've, got, if I've got problems, what did I do? What do you mean I've done anything? Mark Smith's one of the finest men I know. Car wreck about wiped him out, broke almost every bone in his body. He said he, he was in pain for the, he's been in pain the rest of his days. And then the cancer to the kidney. And bang, 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 bang. I don't know. I, I have no answer for that at all. But I tell you what, the, the way to handle that is love them, pray with them, support them. Speak a good word every kind of time you can. Stand, stand by them. And God, him, are they Christians or non-Christians? They're, they're Christians. You can, God's got more at stake in this than, than any of us do. And the Holy Spirit will be faithful. And he will, he will speak, he will lead, he will work, he will guide in their lives. And God is able to somehow sanctify that suffering 
to their own spiritual good. I had an old pastor who used to say, there's some people God can trust enough to let them suffer. And they become literally spectacles in the universe and God can say to the angels, look, look, they suffer yet they still glorify me. Question. By the way, if there are any parents here with children and you need to slip out, you, you won't hurt my feelings. Or anybody that needs to slip out, you won't hurt my feelings. Just come back. <laughs> anybody? Any more questions? All done? Must be, is there some law against asking questions in church? And <laughs> It's okay. If, uh, if you've got some private questions, I'm, I'll, I'll hang around up here tonight, okay? So just drift up this way, very nonchalantly, and, and uh, nobody will guess.